Thank you. You may be seated. For those of you who are not aware of what I was doing, I was turning on our tape system for the evening. Uh, That's why I disappeared during that last song. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're tonight looking at Acts chapter 12 and looking at verses 12 through 17. Some exciting things happening in the life of the early church. Things that we can learn a lot about. Not merely for intellectual head knowledge, but so that we will learn what we ought to be doing. And one of those instances is what we discover as we are looking at tonight. O ye of little faith. Acts chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 12 through 17. We'll begin by a quick review of what we looked at last week. The church had gathered together, praying for Peter. Peter is locked up in prison, and um, they're afraid that Peter's going to die. James has just been killed by Herod. And so the church suddenly shocked into reality that the apostles do not lead charmed lives that they are human just like all the rest, has gathered together for prayer. And we looked at several very important prayer principles, principles that are illustrated for us in the text, but stated for us doctrinally in the epistles. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. It should be a lifestyle for the believer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul says, brethren, pray for us. Even the apostles felt the need for prayer. How much more should we feel the need for prayer? We notice here in the text that's before us in Acts tonight that uh, the men showed up for prayer meeting. It wasn't just ladies who showed up for prayer meeting. And Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2.8, I will therefore that men, and he uses the term for males, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And the emphasis is on the holiness of the hands. We've been studying the Lord, our righteousness, one of his divine names in the morning worship service, and how important it is that we are leading holy lives when we come before God asking our prayer requests. We noted in Romans 8.26 that our prayers are always weak and feeble compared to the divine language of heaven. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God the Holy Spirit takes our weak and feeble prayer requests and brings them before the throne of grace on our behalf. We see in Colossians 1.9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul prayed for those under his care, under his authority, that they might know the will of God, that they might understand the will of God, and that they might obey the will of God. Certainly a prayer that each one of us can pray one for another. It is a prayer worthy of not only repetition, but of fervent desiring of God, because that's what brings the body of Christ to maturity. We saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, very much similar to that one in Colossians. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. You have been called to be Christians. We've talked about that in our Sunday morning services. Worthy of this calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. The lives of believers are to be good, beneficial, pure. We are to have a work of faith with power, not merely the flesh. Something we can pray for one another. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And as I requested that you pray that for me, that God's word would go forth from this pulpit with power, that it would have free course, that Jesus Christ would be glorified, magnified, exalted, and held up for all to see. And then Hebrews 13, 18, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Praying for the character of Christ to be reflected in one another. In this case, Paul asking that to be true of him as he writes to the church at Jerusalem. 
And then James chapter 5 verse 16, we covered that very briefly this morning as we were talking about praying for people who have sinned and those things that are sins unto death and those things which are not sins unto death. And James writes, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Again, the emphasis on men praying, how important it is that men be involved in the life of the church in prayer. And so that brings us to our passage for tonight, Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, the keepers before the doors of the prison. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And he did so. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And we contrasted the will of Herod versus the sovereign will of God, and the will of the people with the sovereign will of God. And God's will always wins. And the will of God is for our good and for his glory. It was for the good of James and for the church when James was slain. It was for the good of Peter and the good of the church that Peter was delivered. God was never too soon. God is never too late the same night. The third clause showed us the condition of the object of God's plan. A man who is in the center of God's will is able to sleep soundly because he trusts in God. And we went over many different passages that Peter may have been meditating on that Christ would have taught him during the years of ministry that our Lord was on earth. Psalm chapter 4 and verse 3. Psalm 121. Psalm 127. Perhaps he was meditating on the words of the Lord when the Lord said, Fear them not which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body. Peter was not afraid. Peter was tired. Peter went to sleep. You and I tend to get fearful, and it keeps us awake, and we mull things over in our mind, and it, it rolls over, and it rolls over, and it rolls over, and every time it does, it gets worse. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill until we are absolutely terrified, and then the thing we fear does not happen. And how much energy and how much time we waste like that. How much opportunity for faith. How much opportunity for trusting in what God is doing in our lives. God is sovereign. God is in control. We need to put that into practice and not just talk about it. Peter certainly understood the principles why we don't need to fear. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Peter didn't write that. Paul wrote that. But it's clear from our text that Peter understood it. Paul writes to Timothy, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Paul writes to the Hebrews and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Christ conquered Satan, so why should we fear? Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Peter was looking forward to having his head cut off the next day, and Peter went to sleep. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. If you've ever really been afraid, you have You've experienced the inner pain that comes with fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear will keep you from spiritual maturity. 
fear will keep you from the kind of love that God says we are to have one for another and that we are to have for him. Perfect love casts out fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We saw there were four short commands given in the text here. God didn't wait for Peter to fiddle around. God, through the angel, spoke to him four short commands and expected Peter to obey immediately. When God speaks to us, God expects us to obey immediately. The angel didn't tell him what to do after he took him only one block away from the prison. He left him. You and I, when God gives us leading and guiding, expects us to then stop and think, what is it God wants me to do at this point? God got him out of the hard stuff and said, now Peter, you're on your own. Do what you know is right. How often do we sit there thinking, well, God has got to sort of drag me along from this point. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sort of sit here and let God carry me along. God has given you gifts, spiritual gifts. God has given you talents, natural talents. God has given you resources. God has given you abilities. God has given you opportunities. God has given you a precise point in human history where you are to make a difference. He's given you all the tools that are necessary. He has given you his word that tells you how you are to live. And so you apply that to the point where you find yourself today. The people around you, your own personal life and your walk with God, the people that you will come in contact with tomorrow, Perhaps people that you're going to send an email to tonight after this service is over or tomorrow. People that are co-workers with you. God is giving you opportunities and he has given you precisely what is necessary for the situation in which you will find yourself. God never puts us into a situation for which he has not already prepared us if we were paying attention. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Nothing comes down your road that is too hard for you because God has prepared you. If you were paying attention, if you were listening, if you were studying, if you were reading his word, if you were meditating upon his word, if you were in constant communication with him through your prayer life, if you are looking for opportunities to witness... God will send them because he has prepared you for the next step of life's journey, the Christian life journey. And so we find that God delivered Peter out of the most impossible of all situations. And Peter went somewhere. It says he thought about it for a minute. Starting in verse 12, when he had considered the thing, Peter woke up finally. He was still groggy as the angel was doing these things, and he was just sort of moving mechanically as the angel told him, wake up. The angel had to smack him in the side to get him up. And then he said, look, get on your shoes. Get on your robe. Come on, get up. Let's go. And they go, and Peter thinks he's seeing a vision. He'd had a vision in Acts chapter 10. And when he wakes up, when he finally comes to his senses, cold night air hits him in the face, it says he considered the thing says, now God got me out of prison, which means he doesn't want me to be Herod's prisoner. I am not going to sit here in the street until tomorrow morning when they come out looking for me. And then what did he do? He didn't decide to run off and hide in the hills first. The first thing he did was he wanted to let the church know what God had done. When God does something special in your life, is your first immediate reaction, I've got to tell others, I'm sure they were praying about this. They've been praying for me. I need to let them know that God answers prayer. What an incredible encouragement to the church. Now we're going to see that there's some odd responses when Peter first shows up. But, but what an incredible encouragement that was to the church. They had just seen James murdered. And now they pray for Peter. They hadn't prayed for James. But they pray for Peter, and God answers prayer. Oh, dear friends, how important it is to pray with 
faith. Even the smidgenest, littlest, tiniest, mustard seed faith, which is all these people had. We see that by the way they respond when Peter shows up. And God answered prayer. When he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. You know, I wish I could say that we had a prayer meeting as many as we have out on Sunday morning or even Sunday evening. My dad used to call prayer meeting the hour of power. And it is. That's where God's people join together corporately. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Gathered together to speak corporately with God of heaven, the God who made all things, the God who controls all things in his sovereignty, gathered together because they believe that there is a real God, and not merely someone to whom we tip our hats on Sunday, gathered together because they believe that God is worth more than their evening football game on the television, who believe that God is more important than having a relaxed dinner on Wednesday evening. But there's a real God to whom someday they will give an account who will say, okay, on this Wednesday evening, why weren't you in prayer meeting? On this Wednesday evening, why weren't you in prayer meeting? On this Wednesday evening, why weren't you in prayer meeting? Do you know that that night there was a great spiritual battle going on and those who were at prayer meeting that night were wrestling with the forces of darkness for the protection of the church and for the good of one another and for the country of the United States. And they were praying for you, but you weren't there. Do you believe in prayer? Do you believe in corporate prayer? That's what we see going on in this chapter. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. They said unto her, As adults would want to do, Thou art man. You're as nutty as a fruitcake, Rhoda. Loony little girl. Man. Must have gotten to you, haven't had enough sleep, run off to bed now. Thou art mad. But she was a determined little girl. She constantly affirmed that it was even so. Okay, humor the kid. That's his angel. It's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. There is somebody at the door. Come on, one of you adults, get out there and open the door. When they had opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. Whoa, Peter, you just messed up our prayer meeting. Don't you realize we're praying for you to get out of prison? Now get back in prison so we can pray about this some more. <laughs> oh my, this is a beautiful humorous text. I think the Lord was smiling in heaven as he saw those believers. They were real Christians as he saw them responding that way to Peter actually showing up at the gate. You know, it's interesting to me. There are millions of different places that Peter could have gone. I mean, you think of all the different places that Peter could have gone. But the one place that he went was where the prayer meeting was actually being God motivated Peter as Peter thought about it. Where shall I go? He didn't go to some other believer's house in Jerusalem. And remember, there were thousands of believers by this time, not only in Jerusalem, but scattered all over the country. He could have gone anywhere. But the first place he stopped was the house prayer meeting was going on. 
God wanted to give the people who were praying the opportunity of seeing that God answers prayer. They didn't hear about it two months later. They didn't hear about it the next morning when Herod got mad and killed the guards. They didn't hear about it when there was this big commotion and everybody said, Peter's gone, we can't find him, though we wanted to kill him today. What we miss in terms of seeing God at work when we are not the ones who are praying. There were thousands of other believers around Jerusalem. They did not all show up at Mary's house. Well, they would have heard about it through the grapevine later on down the road, but they would not have seen the answer that God gave to prayer. powerful picture that we see here. Even with these people with this wishy-washy, weak faith. Verse 17, but he beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace. Because there's a lot of commotion going on here. Peter's here at the door. You mean Rhoda was right? And there's jabber, 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 and everybody's pushing out into the courtyard. They gotta see, is Peter really there? Are you sure? Did you touch him? Is it a fake? Maybe it's somebody who's trying to infiltrate the group. You don't know what those people were saying, but there was a racket going on because Peter had to tell them to be quiet. Beckoning to them with a hand, hold their peace. He declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. They heard it from the horse's mouth. They didn't hear it second hand. They didn't hear it third hand. They didn't hear something had happened. They heard it from Peter. And God was glorified. People, when God does something in your life, if you don't tell others, and He doesn't receive the glory, don't expect Him to do anything else in your life. The reason He does things in your life is so that He will receive the glory. The reason God answers prayer is not merely so that you can feel comfortable about it. The reason God answers prayer is so that you will give Him the glory, that it will be a testimony to other believers, and then to the unbelievers who, in shock, realize that God did something that foiled their plans. God gets the glory. What a blessing to see that here. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. Isn't that interesting? He went to the prayer meeting. He didn't go and talk to the rest of the apostles first. He didn't go to the church leadership first. He came to the prayer meeting. And you know, I think a lot of times Jesus comes to the prayer meeting and everybody else is someplace else. And he departed and went into another place. We're not told where he went. We've talked already about the possibility of a spy network among the believers, about halfway houses where they would hide out, safe houses. We've seen some possibilities of that earlier in the book of Acts. We're not told. Where we're told that he went was he went to a prayer meeting. And we're given the name of probably a very young teenage girl who is recorded in the eternal word of God because she was happy that Peter was out of prison. What we miss when we do not pray. You know, this passage <clears throat> introduces us to two of my favorite teenagers in the New Testament. John Mark and Rhoda. Rhoda's name, by the way, means Rosebush. She was probably a young girl between 11 and 15 years old. It's clear that she was unmarried from the term damsel that is used of her. If she'd been much older, she probably would have been married. John Mark, on the other hand, from what we learn of him later, because he's mentioned quite a few times in the New Testament, was probably at this point somewhere between 17 and 19 years old. This is the only place that we hear of Rhoda by name. John is mentioned many times. 
We're not told, but perhaps they were brother and sister. We don't know for sure. But the text clearly states that this is John Mark's home. His mother is the one that is the owner of the house. We notice that it is Rhoda who answers the door, something she would have been accustomed to doing if she lived there. The response of the adults is typical of the response of adults that they would give to a little girl of that age who comes in with a tall tale. And they probably thought she doesn't really understand the real world of the adults. Things like that just don't happen. But perhaps most important to notice in this passage is that both of those teenagers, both were part of the prayer meeting. They were both involved in the life of the church that was having a powerful impact in their home. Christian parents who want their children to follow Christ in maturity need to have their children deeply involved in the life of the church as they are growing up through their formative years so that they see the church as an essential part of their faith and service to Christ, not merely a one-hour appendage once a week. Too many parents are surprised when their children walk away from the Lord after they finish high school. A number of recent studies have come up with figures as high as 85% of children raised in the church walk away when they get out of high school. Because it is that percentage of parents who only show up at church once a week. And the kids are smart. They recognize that if that's all the more important it is for my parents, why should I care at all? There are two teens. So we're introduced to a very important young man in this passage who is about to step out with faltering steps, as we'll see, to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be a young man that wants to serve. He's going to be a young man who goes on some missionary trips. He's going to be a young man who fails in some way. We're not told exactly how, other than he leaves in the middle of one of those mission trips. But he's a young man who wants to serve Christ. He's called Marcus in three places in the New Testament, in Colossians 4.10, Philemon 24, and 1 Peter 5.13. In other places he's called John, but the context tells us that we're dealing with the same person. It's clear from what we see here in Acts, he was raised in a Jewish Christian home in Jerusalem. An obviously strong Christian home because that's where the prayer meeting is going on. He has seen miraculous answers to prayer and has had first-hand experience with Peter as God opens the prison door and as he hears Peter a few minutes after Peter's release giving his story. Suppose his parents, or at least his mother, had not opened a home for the prayer meeting that night. He said, you know, the kids are young, we need to get them to bed. After all, there must be synagogue school for John Mark tomorrow, and, you know, Rhoda really needs some more sleep because she's got to help me with some cooking. We're having a big party tomorrow. So the kids are going to go to bed, and you guys go somewhere else to hold your prayer meeting. What damage would she have been doing to her children? What loss would her children have suffered by not having seen what took place that night? Dear people, we're talking practical, real-time living. We're not talking 
Bible stories back there that are interesting to us now but have no real application to life. We're talking about things that God wrote down so that we would know how to live. raised in a Christian home. He's seen the miraculous answers to prayer. Did you know that his mother was a relative of Barnabas? That Barnabas was his uncle? There's another very strong Christian family connection there. Listen to Colossians 4.10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, Touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. This was a family that took seriously the responsibility of raising their children in the fear of the Lord and giving their all to it. It's Paul and Barnabas who are set aside for going on those first missionary trips to regions hither for unknown. son of Peter. Perhaps through the very incident that we have in our text tonight when he saw the supernatural hand of God at work. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5 verses 12 and 13. He's listing various men with whom he's worked and he says, Phil, by Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. And so doth Marcus, my son. Paul had Timothy. Peter had John Mark. Young men who looked up to other godly men, older, wiser, more mature in the faith, and they wanted to be like them. They wanted to be like them. What example are you setting for some younger person? How does your zeal for Christ motivate that younger person to want to serve Christ? How does your diligence in service motivate that young person to want to be diligent for Christ? How does your zeal in service motivate that young person to be zealous for Christ? As we get older, we don't have quite so much energy. The young people have it. What have we done to inculcate that kind of a love, that kind of a diligence, that kind of a zeal to those who look up to you? Paul had Timothy. Peter had John Mark. John Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. John Mark's mother Mary probably said, well, I guess it's okay for him to go because after all, Uncle Barnabas will be along on this. Uncle Barnabas will watch out for him. In Acts chapter 12, 25 and 3, 5, we see him on that journey. We discover in chapter 13, just a few verses later, verse 13, it says he leaves them at Perga. You know, there's a, a major incident that happens right before that. A confrontation with a demon-possessed man, a sorcerer. And he sees the nature of the spiritual warfare. He sees the brutal, deadly nature of the spiritual warfare. Perhaps he chickened out. I don't know. But he leaves them at Perga. In Acts 13, 13. Listen to these verses. Here's chapter 12, verse 25, just a few verses beyond our text. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. 
A few verses later in chapter 13, verse 5, And when they were at Sol Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. That's John Mark. Same one talked about just a few verses earlier. But just six verses later, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. The young man had no idea that this was going to cause a major division between two of God's choicest chosen leaders. Faking flaking out is what caused the fight between Paul and Barnabas. Look down a few verses later in chapter 15, verse 36 and following. After some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So let's give the young man another chance at it. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. Maybe he was scared. Maybe he just thought, this is way too hard. Man, I'm not cut out for this kind of stuff. I mean, we're up day and night. We're walking all over the place. We're getting on boats and we're wearing our sandals out. And I've got blisters and my joints ache and you know, I get up in the morning and I'm all stiff and, man, I haven't had a shower in so long. I don't want to do this kind of stuff. He went not with them to the work. Serving Christ is not a picnic. Serving Christ is work. Serving Christ is not sort of lazily every now and then leaving a tract on a bench where you sat and hope nobody see you left it. Serving Christ is work. He went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Here's an uncle who cared about the spiritual well-being of his nephew. Paul was a driven man. God used Paul in amazing ways. God used Barnabas to rescue Mark, who was about to make shipwreck. And to bring Mark to a stage of spiritual maturity so that later he becomes valuable Paul, who did not want to take him on that missionary journey. He rescued him. We find that John Mark was with Paul during his first imprisonment at Rome. We find that in two of the prison epistles. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 and 9, it says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Then verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, it's a prison epistle. Paul is writing it. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. God brought reconciliation. John Mark's faith was encouraged by his uncle Barnabas. John Mark was willing to risk seeing Paul in prison. And not be afraid. Philemon, verses 22 through 24. 
Paul is writing to Philemon about Onesimus, who was the runaway slave, you recall, who came across Paul in Rome, and Paul led him to Christ, and then Paul sent him back to his master. And Paul writes to Philemon, and he says, But withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Imagine that. Because God let people out. I wonder if Paul was thinking back to the incident in Peter's life. It is in our text tonight in Acts chapter 12. I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Is that a subtle hint or what? That you need to be praying for me. I'm stuck in jail. I can't witness any. I mean, I get some prisoners around me, but hey, God called me to carry the gospel all over the ancient world. That through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. One man in that list has been restored. One man in that list is about to defect. Demas left Paul. And Paul tells us why as he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You see an ebb and flow lives of young people as you move through the New Testament. Some starting out great and failing. Others starting out sort of weakly and failing but being restored and growing to maturity. Others starting out with robust fervor and then tubing out completely. But something makes a difference. Men who are willing to step in shepherd the young men who are faltering, willing to step in and bring them under the wing and help them grow. Amen. Marcus was at Ephesus with Timothy when Paul called for Timothy during his second imprisonment. He asked Timothy to bring Mark to Rome tells us something else, that a bad beginning can be redeemed by the grace of Christ. 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Now listen to the next command that Paul gives as he writes to Timothy. Take Mark. Bring him with thee. And here's the end of the story. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. He is profitable. beginning of that second missionary journey when Paul wanted to have nothing to do with John Mark because he was the weak link in the chain and he would break under pressure. Take Mark and bring him with me for he is profitable unto me for the ministry. We see Mark another place, a very significant other place. John Mark is the author of the Gospel of Mark under Peter's direction. He was the amanuensis, dependent. And you know, it's fascinating to look at the differences between the Gospels. John Mark, clearly, in the very first verse of his Gospel, tells you the theme of his Gospel and the emphasis of his gospel, which is on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, 
the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's what you see all the way through the gospel of Mark. There are these short, punchy statements, to the point statements, all of them pointing to the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. It's the most punchy of all four of the Gospels. And the emphasis is, Jesus is God. What a difference from the timid young man who left the work while his uncle and Paul continued it. Taken under by Barnabas, sort of idolized Peter, becomes Peter's right-hand man. And God chooses him write one of the four Gospels. Can a man who has a bad beginning be redeemed? Can a man who falters in his steps at the beginning of his race still win a race? Can a man who is weak and timid become bold and courageous for Christ so that he is profitable for the ministry? resounding, emphatic, yes. That is a young man that is in heaven enjoying the heavenly rewards that Christ has given to him. When we stand before Christ, whatever the past has been, whatever weakness has been, whatever faltering steps have been, Remember John Mark, how God redeemed him and gave him power in ministry. When he had considered the thing, verse 12, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. As Peter knocked at the door, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. Peter knocked, he didn't just walk in. And Rhoda's response was a response of gladness, not fear from hiding out. You know, it's interesting, the faith of a child who believes, even if their actions sometimes seem irrational, the faith of a child that believes. The adults accuse her, as we saw, of insanity, and then the adults come up with a non-biblical theory. <laughs> How often do adults come up with non-biblical theories just to keep the kid quiet? It sort of goes like this, well, uh, yeah, you, you heard Peter's voice, okay, listen, Rhoda, Peter must have just been killed, and that was his angel. You know, sort of stop by to say goodbye to us. Non-biblical theory, absolutely. It must have been his angel. And then they're astonished at the answer of prayer. They don't believe, and yet God answered them anyway. That's the faith of a grain of a mustard seed. And God is glorified. God is the one who did these things, Peter tells them. And then he tells them, go and tell others. What has God done in your life? It's time to go and tell others. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for what you've done in our lives. Help us to have opportunity to go and tell others. Cause us to make opportunity, not to simply sit and wait for things to happen. Peter didn't just sit, he went. He told, and then he told them to tell others. And then he moved on. Make us a people of faith, a people of gladness when we see the answers to prayer, a people that has the faith of a child, people who understand that you are a God who looks at our hearts and you see a desire to serve and even if there's been failure, you bring us back in, you mentor us, you give us people who will help us to grow in our faith. So that even if someone previously scorned us, we can become profitable to them in ministry. 
Take your word tonight, Father. Use it in our hearts to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for this evening is hymn number 515.